afternoon, Rotarians. Um, today our guest speaker is Bob Karen, and I think many of you would know of uh, Bob with his uh, past history in politics. However, there is a life after politics. Currently, Rob is Chairman of the Regional Development SA, Director of the South Australian Natural, uh, National Football League, Deputy Chair of the Community Football Board, Deputy Chair of the Australian Country Football League, excuse me, a member of the Federal Ministerial Advisory Committee on Regional Australia, and number one ticket holder for the West Adelaide Football Club, and also an ambassador of Adelaide Football Club. Please welcome Rob Carey. Catherine for uh, for that introduction. Um, uh, thank you very much to Rotary for having me back. I spoke here, it must be, I don't know, it might be eight or ten years ago, I suppose, but uh, I was going to say it's great to see so many old faces, but I'll be better off saying uh, familiar faces from times gone by. Uh, in particular, um, acknowledgement to Sir Eric. Um, I was on cabinet for the whole time that Sir Eric was our governor, and uh, he was a fantastic governor, and uh, I used to quite often tell him to slow down, he was doing too much, but he had this uh, creed that he didn't want to leave the job and think he could have done anything more. So uh, uh, he was great to work with and uh, having made an enormous contribution to uh, the community before being governor, he, uh, he did a great job and uh, you do very well having him as an honorary uh, member. Uh, as I said, thanks for the invite. Um, uh, what I thought I'd talk about is um, a bit about what I do now, but it gives a bit of a snapshot of... Uh, probably some of the things that are going on with uh, regional South Australia. Um, I'm fortunate enough to um, be able to choose to some extent some of the things I do uh, and very fortunate that there's enough regional uh, issues to get involved in to, uh, uh, to keep me busy uh, and keep me uh, away from North Terrace. Um, and uh, towards the end, if I've still a bit of time, I'll share a, a few thoughts on uh, the political landscape. Um, when I uh, first left uh, politics, the first job that I was really called in to do uh, was to amalgamate the regional development boards around the state. The federal government, um, uh, well, up until um, a change the federal government wanted to do, the regional development boards were very important around regional South Australia, and they are a uh, partnership between state government and local government. There was the opportunity to get a three-tiered uh, partnership, uh, but it uh, hadn't been particularly well handled in the early stages by the uh, bureaucracy and everyone gone back in their corner. So I had the opportunity to go out and hold a lot of meetings, um, get people talking to each other uh, and try and get together um, federal, state and local. Uh, we did that, we went from 13 boards around the state to seven. Uh, that was a bit contentious at the time, but they seem to have settled in very well and working well. And we are the only state in Australia that's got actually uh, state, federal and local government all working together. And that really gives us a big advantage. Uh, I'm not too sure why it doesn't happen everywhere, um, but it does give us an advantage and, uh, and those boards do a lot of, uh, a lot of good. Um, they do employ, the, uh, the boards employ about uh, 120, 130 people out there doing... Um, the job for the three levels of government across the state. Uh, after I finished that restructure, um, I was asked to come back and chair the peak body um, of, the, of the Regional Development Australia Boards, uh, which is Regional Development SA, um, and that um, um, that is a, a job that I really enjoy doing. It does get me around the, um, the country areas a lot. Uh, I see what's going on uh, and can play some form of <coughs> role in coordinating all of those. There's almost, uh, well not an extension of that, but in addition to that, uh, Simon Crean asked me to go on to a Ministerial Advisory Council on Regional Australia, uh, which is uh, myself, Lindsay Fox, Bill Kelty, Ian Sinclair. Um, Simon Crean is a guy who's passionate about Regional Australia, and he pulled together a group who also are passionate about Regional Australia, and uh, he really does empower us uh, to have a... Um, a good guidance over a lot of the things that do happen across uh, across the nation. There's a big fund uh, that came out of that agreement with the um, 
independence as a result of um, sort of the hung parliament in the last federal election. Um, often that money is very wasted. Uh, Simon gives us a fair sort of role in making sure that that money is actually going where the community want it and not where the bureaucrats or uh, consultants think it should go. Um, so again, I like that job. Um, <clears throat> initially, Simon um, picked out five regions in Australia for particular attention, which uh, is money and other attention. Uh, they were Tasmania, Northern Queensland, La Trobe Valley, the Pilbara and the Murray-Darling Basin. Um, I was able to convince him uh, that the Upper Spencer Gulf in South Australia, in Wyala, Port Augusta and Port Pirie, had some real challenges coming up. Uh, he has agreed to that. Um, that was the last of the ones, but uh, uh, we met in Townsville a couple of weeks ago, and I think that we've actually sort of gone past the others. We've got 12 infrastructure projects in front of the federal government at the moment uh, for funding. So hopefully, uh, through that uh, Upper Spencer Gulf Working Group, uh, we can actually get some money spent uh, in an area that faces some real challenges. Um, you know, lead smelting in Piri, power generable coal power generation in uh, Port Augusta, and uh, steel in Wyala are uh, three industries which, with the carbon future, the Australian dollar, whatever else, face some enormous challenges. But at the same time, we've got a lot of infrastructure, a lot of skills in those three communities, which we really need to make sure that with what's going on in the mining industry, we actually don't miss an opportunity and make sure that a lot of the mining services, the engineering work and a lot of the other work comes to, uh, to those three cities. Otherwise, we will miss an opportunity and that's one of the things that we're uh, uh, very much keeping an eye on. The, um, uh, the second year I was um, away from North Terrace, uh, Viterra, who are a grain handling authority, well, uh, they bought the old South Australian Cooperative Bike Handling. <coughs> Excuse me. So they own all the ports and they own about uh, over 90% of the, uh, uh, the grain storage in the state. Um, there was a bit of resentment about a Canadian firm coming in and uh, buying ABB. Um, the farmers did very well out of selling to them, I can tell you. Um, but. Um, they actually struck the most difficult season you could possibly have with an enormous amount of rain uh, in November, December and into January. Uh, a lot of grain downgraded and a lot of very disgruntled farmers. <coughs> um, after that season there was um, oh, there were select committees federally and state about what happened and whatever else. Uh, Viterra asked me to come in and head up a, uh, a review of their operations, uh, which I did for the next uh, uh, you know, about five months we did the review. Um, they were very cooperative, we've got to say they were terrific to work with, but we went around and uh, had about probably 30, 40 meetings across the state, made sure that all the protagonists had an opportunity to have their say, uh, went back, had a total look at their operations, um, <coughs> we made 30 recommendations, Viterra accepted the whole 30, uh, at enormous cost to them I might add, uh, but then they actually asked me back to oversee an implementation team. We met every second week and each one of those 30 recommendations was to be reported on and not one group missed having the, the update in there for the whole thing. So within 12 months they actually turned around their operation to, uh, after the next harvest, uh, all the satisfaction surveys they did were very high. So uh, that, was, that was a good one to be involved in. That operation has now been unsolved. Um, uh, to another company out of uh, out of Europe, uh, so um, this bit about uh, selling off Australian ownership um, is looming large in that particular industry. But as I said, farmers have done very very well out of uh, out of both of those. Glencore that have actually come in and uh, <coughs> bought Viterra. Uh, a lot of South Australians had Viterra shares, uh, which were about ten dollars each. Uh, Glencore came in and paid sixteen dollars for those shares. So uh, again, they did. Uh, <coughs> Yeah, the growers did pretty well out of it, uh, but what they've got to realise is if, they, if you sell your shares and get your money, you tend to lose a lot of control of those particular things. Um, at present, uh, I'm doing a... Um, uh, well, I was called in to do a restructure of the South Australian Farmers Federation, which has been around for a long, long time. Um, I had a look at um, the books. I talked to a lot of people who had left the Farmers Federation and I did go back to the board and say that 
I thought we were better off uh, closing SAF down and going for a whole new structure, uh, which I thought might be hard to convince them of. But what had happened with the Farmers Federation is over the last 10, 12 years, dairy had walked away, horticulture had walked away, grapes had walked away, and grain had walked away, which didn't leave much there at all. And you found the Farmers Federation, once I think 20 odd thousand members, down to about seven or 800, uh, and really, they could only really lay claim to representing the livestock industry uh, and pigs and poultry, and the livestock guys were very split about the operation of SAF. Um, a lot of people thought that farmers would not want the organisation wound up and were anti-change. That definitely is not the case. I put a proposal to their AGM uh, to close SAF down, uh, open up, uh, well, there were three organisations already covering wine grapes, dairy and grain, and we're setting up organisations for the other commodity <coughs> groups and then setting up a body over the top that looks after the cross-commodity issues with the commodity organisations looking after, like grains look after a grain issue, dairy look after a dairy issue, but the peak body will look after things such as roads and natural resource management, taxation, uh, all of those issues. So that's a work in progress. Uh, hopefully that'll all happen in about five or six weeks and we'll have a new organisation up and running. Uh, farmers have not had a strong voice and I think that's shown uh, a lot over the last 10, 15 years. It's a problem right across Australia. The other states are watching what we're doing. Uh, but also for government it's good because if you're a government at the moment and you've got a primary industries issue, uh, there's not really anyone you can go to who represents uh, a large portion of the farmers out there, which creates <coughs> some massive issues. Uh, Catherine mentioned the football. Um, challenging times, uh, SANFL-wise, I've been a director there for about four years. Um, we've had, of course, the, the move to Adelaide Oval. We've had uh, uh, Port Adelaide uh, financial issues, which has uh, sort of soaked up a lot of the, uh, the finances. Uh, and we're trying to deal with the issue of the transfer of the licences from the SANFL to the clubs, which I think ultimately is a great move for everybody. It will remove uh, the Port Adelaide risk from the SANFL books and transfer that to the AFL, which I think is a terrific move. Um, and hopefully uh, that will all be done by the end of November. Um, the community football side of things, very important. Uh, the Community Football Board actually look after everything other than AFL and SANFL. Uh, so they do the, uh, all the amateur league in the country. Uh, country football is just absolutely vital out there. It is the heartbeat of, uh, of a lot of country communities, particularly those under about 4,000 people. Uh, those small towns just really rely on their footy club and just trying to keep them viable uh, and make sure that uh, the game thrives in those areas is a challenge. Uh, but there's been a lot of work put into it. Um, and we've actually got, uh, as our major sponsors, the Motor Accident Commission, who are working with us because one of the real issues with country footy clubs is the number of young lads that you've lost over the years because of uh, drinking and driving. Country football clubs have, have traditionally been the worst spot for that. So in, in, in working with the Motor Accident Commission, uh, we have a heap of seminars for young guys around the country areas, very well attended. Um, you've seen probably the, uh, the promotional thing about don't be a, a wanker and don't be a knob and that sort of thing. That, you know, the motor accident guys are really happy with that campaign. I think it is making a difference out there uh, and saving some lives. Um, so that's good. Regional SA, uh, in a nutshell, a lot of challenges out there. Uh, the Australian dollar is really clobbering uh, regional Australia, regional South Australia. Not only does it mean you get less for your, your wheat and your dairy and whatever else because of the dollar, but the cost of employing labour out there is just unbelievable at the moment because of the, uh, you've got to compete with the mining industry. If you uh, run a, you know, if you're trying to uh, you get a good guy who can drive a header and a tractor and whatever, um, you know, those guys can make 130, 140 in the mines. Uh, 15 years ago on a farm you would have got someone like that for 45, 50,000, nowadays it's a hell of a lot more. Uh, so it's impacting them from both sides. Uh, and the tourism, the same thing, Phil would know that well. Um, 
that uh, really tourism, the Australian dollar has knocked it uh, for six. And it was always a thought of mine with the mining tax, if I are going to have a mining tax, then some of that money would have been well spent going into huge promotion for Australian tourism uh, and for also marketing Australian primary, project, primary production overseas. Um, but uh, yeah, so there's some real issues with sustainability there. Um, Politics, um, I shake my head federally. Uh, I sat home and watched Question Time yesterday <coughs> afternoon on, on Sky News and uh, you know, I just really hope that things over there sort themselves out with the next election. Uh, and that's not a political statement of one side or the other, but I just think that the standards in Canberra have been pretty horrible the last few years. Uh, I think part of that is the fact that um, we didn't make up our mind as far as putting one party or the other in. I think that creates a lot of the uncertainty, uh, a lot of the problems that are there. But uh, yeah, I thought yesterday was was a pretty low ebb, uh, but that's been coming for quite a while. And uh, um, you know, let's hope that sooner or later it'll improve. Um, the last speech I made to the parliament here, I made the point that you hear a lot of the pollies complain about how they're not respecting the media or not respecting the public. Well, the point I'd make, if you don't respect each other, then you can't expect others to respect you. Um, and I think that's a, a real issue that uh, across <coughs> politics in general. Uh, factions are another one, but uh, uh, that's a big issue. As far as state politics, um, I've been surprised over the last 10 years just how little uh, coverage state politics now gets in the <coughs> media. Like the media seems to be centralised a lot. Unfortunately, I turn the TV on now, and most nights it's four crime stories before there's any, or natural disasters is the other one. Politics really seems to have slid down. Uh, it will be an interesting 12 months ahead uh, in the state. However, um, until the federal election's out of the way in uh, September, uh, there'll be very little oxygen for the state, and then you'll slide into uh, the end of football finals, not far off Christmas, and may have March next year. So I think that uh, the election campaign in South Australia from media point of view will be uh, just a, a rush, rush to the finish. Catherine, how am I going time-wise? Um, well, you have yeah, plenty of time. You've got plenty of time. <laughs> have I? And if you want to take some questions. All right. Um, okay. Yeah, well, perhaps go to questions. Okay. okay. Has anyone yeah. got any questions, please? Barbara. Barbara. Right, well, I'll make a comment and a question. First of all, I'd like to congratulate you on the way you've brought regional South Australia together. Mm. As you know, I was past chair of an area consultative committee for 10 years that looked after all the electorate of the grey. And as you know, you and I had many debates about the new structure. And it's working. Well done. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Rob, can you tell us um, the connection between South Australia and China, particularly in such things as what we see at Balcarva with the hay? and all that sort of thing, and how we're going, the dairy industry is another area where we're big with China. Can you talk about that, please? Yeah, I think we could, we could probably do a lot more with China. Again, we were building big time into China sort of uh, up until about 2002, 2001, 2002. And of course what's happened after that is uh, the Australian dollar really crawled us in China, uh, particularly for things such as uh, you know, food and wine, it became very, very difficult. Uh, there have been quite a few uh, you know, dairy cows, beef cows, that type of thing go in there. Of course, they're very much one-off um, sort of exports when you're, when you're sending stuff in to help them produce their own. But that's been a good trade for us. Um, and I know Persa at the moment are doing another push to try and get back stronger into that Chinese market. But the Australian dollar really has affected us badly. Yes. Yep. Uh, Rob, thanks very much. It's been a very illuminating uh, address. I guess my question is an extension of Trevor's. Selling off the farm. I mean, it, it's, we seem to be caught in a paradox between a dollar which is killing our local industry uh, and because of the way we're approaching it, we're, we're you know, taking it from a small perspective, whereas the players that are buying in, they've got a long-term view and a lot more resources at their disposal. Where does that lead us? Yeah, look, I, I wouldn't worry as much as some people do. Um, one thing about, you know, they're shifting their money in. Money's mobile, uh, and we need the investment. The land is not mobile. 
the lamb will stay here. Uh, and I had this discussion with someone the other day about the Chinese buying a big uh, poultry business in Victoria. The label will still be local, the feed supply will still be local, uh, the transport will still be local. Um, okay, the profits might be going elsewhere, but the investments come from there. Uh, so I wouldn't worry about it as much as some do. I think one of the biggest issues, though, is we should have a better tab on what is owned from overseas. It just seems a nonsense. We haven't got a lot better track of things. Oh, that was my... I said it for the 18 minutes, so... <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we need a better tab on it. I think that's, that's more the issue, because we don't want to sell everything. But we can't develop this country without the you know, overseas capital, but we should keep a hell of a track on, on where it's at. I, I get, this is, sorry, just a quick extension. Everyone's focused on land. What worries me is intellectual property. Uh, how do we keep track of that? Yeah, and, and that's more mobile. Yeah, I'll be more, more worried about the mobile stuff that we sell. And intellectual property has always been one. we we'll take one more here. One more question. Oh, John? Rob, uh, in view of the fact that we got down to 3.3 .3 billion at one stage, and we're now pushing through 14 billion. How long can we go on borrowing just to finance South Australia? Yeah, I, you know, I'm concerned about that. I think that um, you know, with debt, you know, people talk about good debt and bad debt and whatever. But uh, at the end of the day, it really is on on our kids' bank cards. Um, and once you get to the stage where you're just having to spend so much of your income on interest, really, you, you, you get into the that really hurts you, uh, and particularly borrowing for other than infrastructure really is a worry because you, you sort of, when you start borrowing to pay public servants, then I think you've got a, you've got a real problem, and probably too many public servants. Okay. And David's mostly last question. Yes, David. Yes, uh, Rob, uh, instead, of, um, instead of developing our fine uh, rural lands around Mount Barker and so on and so forth to accommodate the increase in population coming up, wouldn't it be better to uh, uh, develop some of our regional centres? And what would be the attitude of your committee, the Regional Development Committee, to that proposal? Uh, they love it. Um, it's been a real challenge in, in South Australia. Like I, I don't know what the figures are now, but if you go back about 10, 12 years ago, South Australia was the most rely, reliant of any state on its regional areas, like financially, and yet we have the biggest percentage living in Adelaide, which was you know, a real mismatch of the two. We, we really suffer from not having a second big city. Like I think Tasmania's got three or four cities bigger than our second biggest. Queensland's probably got 15 bigger than our second biggest, and the same with the other states. You know, the fact that we've got Adelaide, and then our next is, you know, Mount Gambier, Murray Bridge, around that, you know, 20-odd 20, 20 mark, uh, really hurts us badly. Uh, and sooner or later, We've just got to start moving some people out there. Unfortunately, it's actually going the other way. Mm. So it's not as if, even as if uh, you know we need to quicken it up. We need to turn it around uh, because you know really the health services and whatever else. Unless you've got a fair few people out there, you just can't afford to give them what, what people need. So they keep moving away. Okay. Well, I think that's it. Okay. One question for the Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, Rob. I'm the old I'm obviously right-winger. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the old peninsula. We have a huge debate going on over there about wind farms. And, uh, and you know, it's very important. It's probably mixed depending on which board you talk to. You know, they, they handle that themselves. It does bring... There's no doubt, like, uh, I, I had a fair bit to do as a local member with when they set the one up at Snowtown. And that community's done incredibly well out of it. A lot of the farmers there, it sort of has drought proofed them to some extent because a lot of them getting 60, 80, 100,000, well, not a lot, but that, that's the higher figures. Well, you go 40, 60, 80, 100,000 as a set income every year. So it's sort of, it sorted them out. They've got no real problem with them. I think the biggest problem with wind farms is uh, what the number of wind farms is doing to the price of electricity, because you know, that's really jagged up what we're actually paying for electricity. Um, I can remember a briefing. I signed off on the first wind farm down at Mount Bonnie, uh, Lake Bonnie, and the briefing said 
you should never go past about 16, 17% of your power coming from, from wind because of the fact you had to build the other capacity to pick up when the wind didn't blow. And we've got ourselves into a, a pretty difficult position with that, which only now more interconnection with the other states can probably ever get us out of. Thank you. I think we'll leave it there. Thanks, Rob, for your address. Very interesting. Gives us another perspective of what's happening on our state or in our state. And as a thank you, I'd like to give you our pen, which I hope you carry with you all times. Thank you.